When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Welcome to One Last Network and the art of good grief. Good grief? If you're as old as I am, you know good grief was a common epithet for the cartoon boy named Charlie Brown, especially when Lucy pulled one of her tricks. I mean, honestly, Lucy was an awful bully. Today, good grief might take on many meanings, and E.B. Bartell digs into the idea of good grief in her new book, Good Grief, on loving pets here and hereafter. E.B. is a nonfiction writer, a former Newtonville Books bestseller, and a Grub Street instructor with a Master in Fine Arts from Columbia University. Her essays and interviews have appeared in Slate, Salon, Literary Hub, and many other publications. In Good Grief, she explores the world of loving and losing animals, the singular nature of the human companion-animal bond, and how best to grieve for them once they've left our physical world. Darlene Woodward of Panthetown Photography in Georgetown, Massachusetts, interviews E.B. about good grief. Have a listen. Hello. I am so excited today that I'm here with E.B. Bartels. We are going to dive into her book that was published last year called Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter. So, E.B., thank you so much for being with us today and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. How's your day going? It's going pretty well. Um, my dog Seymour and I just went for a little walk around the neighborhood. I always try to tire him out before I get on the phone or on Zoom. Um, and now he's snoozing right by my feet. <laughs> I love that. I love that because and we're all animal people. So we do get it if there's some announcements or dogs barking or dogs scratching. But oh, I know yeah, it's yeah. right before Zoom where we're just <laughs> trying to get it all organized. Yeah, uh, apologies in advance if the UPS truck drives by because Seymour is not a fan of UPS or FedEx or Amazon Prime. So I love, it. I love it. We can all relate to that. That is awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I'm excited. I, I just finished reading your book. I absolutely loved it. So let's actually, before we even dive into that, I know you said you had many pets at the moment. And what do, who is in your life right now for animals? Sure. Yeah. Let's start with the living pets. Um, so I, like I said, I have a dog. His name is Seymour. He is a mostly Chihuahua pit bull mix with some Schnauzer and rat terrier and a few other types of terriers. So he's like 30 pounds and he's muscly like a pit bull, but has sort of that like, you know, angry Chihuahua energy sometimes. And, um, his prey drive is nuts. He always Uh-oh. goes after squirrels, rabbits, um, he has killed three rabbits this season. So he is, he is intense, but he's, he's a <laughs> Um, Then we also have um, two tortoises, um, Terrence uh, and Twyla. Terrence is about 10 years old and Twyla is about five. Okay. Um, both red-footed tortoises. Um, and I've had Terrence actually almost 10 years. Um, and I just, I've always loved reptiles. I had a tortoise when I was in middle school, um, which I write about in the book. And yeah. I always wanted another one once I was an adult. So this woman was giving Terrence away on Craigslist. So I, I rescued him and then um, we got him, uh, Twyla, his wife, <laughs> as we call her, um, just this past fall. And then we have actually a small flock of fancy pigeons because my husband always has grown up loving pigeons. He has a soft spot for what he calls uh, trash birds. So seagulls, pigeons, crows, birds that sort of get dismissed as like dirty or city birds. Um, And uh, the pigeons we rescued from different animal orgs around Massachusetts. And um, they're all ones that were bred to be like show fancy pigeons. So like a king pigeon, it's like white and very big. Um, Or a pigeon Bert is a a Valencian figurita pigeon, which has this fancy little ruffle. And so they live in a flock. Um, 
in a coop outside sort of like chickens would and then um my husband also has a fish tank with a dozen african cichlids but that's really his territory i don't touch the <laughs> fish tank <laughs> like he does the fish and i'll take care of that so. yeah i do the tortoises he does the fish we split the pigeons we split the dog that's kind yeah. of our divide <laughs> so so you get a busy household that's a lot of fun we do lots of creatures so let's dive into your book, your first book, um, published just last year, called Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter. And just give us a, we'll start with just a basic about the book. Yeah, so the book, um, I mean, its origin story is just, I've been someone who's had a lot of pets all throughout my life. And as people with pets know, um, we've yet to figure out how to make pets live forever. So if you're someone who's had a lot of pets, that usually means you're also someone who's had a lot of pets die. Um, and the book came about because when I was in my MFA program for grad school, I was working on um, a thesis about something else. It was like a family memoir um, and when I needed a break from writing that material, I found I was drawn to writing these short personal essays about pets I'd had, and those inevitably ended with how those pets died and the things I did to memorialize them. And I brought a few of those essays into my workshop and my friends just really responded to them. And all of a sudden they wanted to share their own pet loss stories and the different rituals they had and traditions their families made, you know, to honor their pets. And one of my friends who's very smart, she worked as a journalist for a long time. She said, you know, it'd be cool if maybe you sprinkled in some fun facts like about what people in other cultures do or throughout history, you know, to mourn pets. Because she pointed out that there's not really one standardized thing to do when your pet dies. Um, you know, there's not for people either, but usually you have a little more guidance. So like, you know, if you're raised Catholic or if you're raised Jewish or Muslim, like you have different death rituals usually with those religions or if you're you know part of a certain culture or grew up in a certain country often you know you have death rituals for people in place that you can follow um, but with pets it's really a free-for-all so I started to do some research on this and I just fell into this like black hole and very quickly was like I could write a whole book about this this is more than just a few fun facts in in an essay so um I actually, after I graduated from my MFA program, I shelved the thesis material and switched and started focusing on the, the pets instead. And it's been so inspiring and wonderful to learn about all the different things people do all around the world and also all throughout history um, to remember and memorialize their pets. You know, I think often when I would mention what I was writing about to people, people would be very quick to say like, oh, of course, like now people are having these big elaborate funerals for their pets because like more people are having pets instead of having kids or people have more disposable income that can go towards having pets, which like, you know, during the Great Depression, they couldn't. And, you know, I'm always quick to point out, you know, actually pretty much as long as people have had pets, people have had you know, mourning and grieving rituals to memorialize those pets. And like I, in my research, you know, read about these dog cemeteries that are thousands and thousands of years old that are often um, part of like indigenous communities above the Arctic Circle who relied on dogs, you know, for survival. So they had very close relationships with their dogs. You know, in ancient Egypt, people would mummify their pets and have those bodies in the tomb with them so they could be together in the afterlife you know, they're animal mummies in Peru. There have been dog cemeteries found in the Middle East. It's really all over the world. Um, so yeah, I love learning about that. And honestly, I could have, I could have written this book probably like 20 times with different facts in different countries. And, um, you know, it, it was so awesome to learn about all this stuff. Oh, I bet. That's amazing. So there's going to be a book two and a book three, right? You still have a oh, lot. Of <laughs> I hope so. I know I'm already joking with my editor. I'm like, can I do like a revised, you know, a, an anniversary edition with more facts? And I right. feel like since the book has been published too. people keep sending me things and like cool articles about more stuff that I'm like, oh, I wish I had known about that when I was writing the book. But it's just it's there's so much out there and it's um, really amazing. Right. Now, how did you find people to talk to for the book? Because this, la I mean, this took place over quite a few years where you reached out to people. And yeah, how did you find these people to talk to? 
That's a great question um, because I think I went about it a little bit differently than maybe some um, people do when they're researching a work of nonfiction um, or journalism. So it actually, it really, it took me 10 years almost from the, I wrote the very first pet essay, started thinking about researching some stuff in fall 2012, and then the book came out in summer 2022. So almost a full decade. Um, And when I was looking for people to talk to, um, you know, when I was reading materials that were written by experts and researchers, often I would just try to contact them directly. Like I, when I was reading about the animal mummies in Egypt, there's this incredible archaeologist named uh, Dr. Salima Ikram, and she's quoted in like every book about animal mummies. And so I like on a whim, I was like, maybe she'll respond to my email. And she's super nice and is a professor at a university in Cairo and wrote back to me. And I like woke up in the middle of the night to have a Zoom call with her on, like at a time that was convenient for her. And she was great. Um, so some people I reached out to that way, but that was usually like professionals or experts. But throughout the book, I also quote a lot of people um, who are just regular people who've had pets, like different pet owners um, and their stories. And I felt when you're talking about something like pet grief, um, you know, it's a sad and hard topic. And then it's also a disenfranchised type of grief, you know, one that people don't talk about as openly or regularly as they do. Maybe, I don't know, the loss of a parent or a grandparent is more sort of socially acceptable to talk about. So I really strongly didn't want to approach anybody and make them feel like they had to talk to me or feel obligated or pressured. So I did a lot of sort of putting stuff out there and letting people reach out to me if they were interested. So um, I actually use social media a lot where I would post on Facebook or on Twitter and I would say like, hey, um, has anybody gotten a tattoo to memorialize a pet who's passed away? If you have and you want to share, I'd love to talk to you. So then there we go. Everyone yeah, just had to show my tattoo. Yeah. Um, you know, so then people would respond and, and reach out and say like, oh yeah, like I have six for all my cats or whatever it is. Like, I'd love to talk to you. Or sometimes people would say like, oh, you know, my sister just got one. Let me talk to her and see if she'd be interested. So I, I tried to let it, you know, people could come to me because I feel like with such a difficult, you know, hard thing to talk about I didn't want to force anyone to have to share stories that they weren't comfortable or or wanting to revisit and I feel like a lot of times people aren't necessarily going to offer talking about their pets rather than if it's open they're more than happy to it's almost that oh I don't know if I'm going to be judged or that sort of thing because like you said the whole disenfranchised grief and everything and people aren't necessarily wanting to share openly but once they know it's okay to share it makes it a lot easier and they're more willing to open up oh definitely and I found you know as soon as I mentioned what I was writing about and also as soon as I made it clear that I was writing this book from the perspective of a fellow pet owner who has lost and loved and lost pets not just like a journalist who's trying to like poke fun at a subculture or something like that people were so quick to open up to me because they saw like oh she gets it like she's been there and it's just like floodgates and honestly sometimes at book events it's overwhelming like people want to share all these stories and so many people who I interviewed for the book like it killed me but they would say after we talked you know often they would cry and I'd apologize for making them cry and they would say you know (laughs) actually like it felt really good to talk about this with someone and so many people said I've never spoken about this with anyone before and that was just devastating to me to hear because it's like you're telling me about this 15 year long relationship you had with this being you shared your home with who you spent like every single night with, you know, and you never talked to anyone about this loss you felt because you were worried that people would make fun of you because it was a cat and not a person. And, you know, I'm not equating, you know, necessarily a person's death and a pet's death, but like people have all kinds of relationships with all kinds of beings. And, you know, like, I interviewed a lot of people who were older, who live alone, who were estranged from their, you know, um, birth families often, um, or their human families just live really far away. And so like their dog was their main daily family member who they saw every single day. So 
my hope with publishing this book is that it sort of gives people an opening to share stories and to realize they're not alone. There are tons of people. There are lots of communities who um, understand and get it and are willing to, you know, share and listen. And, um, you know, I hope people just don't feel so alone with that. But I totally get, you know, not wanting to share because you're afraid of the reaction. And I always think of mm -hmm. these two different stories I heard. Um one after the book came out someone mentioned to me that she um had asked her boss once to take the next day off to go home to be with her parents to help um to be with them when they euthanized her childhood cat and her boss was like well i guess that's okay but it's actually really inappropriate you asked to wow. take the day off to euthanize a cat and like oh, she was, she was pissed, obviously. Yeah, and I think we've come a long way, but still, it's yeah. still a long way to go. And like, you know, of course, after that happened, she was like, I wish I had just like lied and said I was sick, you know, in the morning or whatever. But you then you know, when I was, you know, working on the book, um, a friend of mine met, told me the story about like, she lives in the Boston area now, but she's from, I think, North Dakota. Okay. And she was right out of college, totally broke, um, living in Boston, had her first job and found out her parents needed to put down their cat, her childhood cat. She really wanted to fly home to be there for it, but just like could not afford it. And she happened to mention this like in passing to her boss because like, I don't know how it came up. And he just transferred all his airline miles to her so she could fly home to be there. Like, didn't oh, even goodness. she didn't ask him to do that. And she told me she was like, I don't even think he was like particularly like a big pet person. He just really got that this was important to her and did that. And I wow. just I thought that was really cool. So it's it's scary because you just like it's choose your own adventure. You have no idea how right. people are going to react. And that's right. you don't want to be judged. And that is. That's absolutely amazing that her boss did that. That is yeah. wonderful. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. I love how you included throughout the book stories of pets that you had growing up and you even, and this is the one story that got me because I was a dog walker for years myself. And you talked about how you were watching one of your best friends pets and that it passed away while you were in your care and that different type of grief as not being your own pet because but now you had your best friend who you were so worried about that relationship after and you were so brave I want to say when you had to tell your friend that because I don't know if I could have done that <laughs> but yeah share a little bit about that I, that's one story that had such an impact on me yeah, well, I think in general, um, one reason why pet death can be can hit people so hard is because of this weight of responsibility, you know, like um, your pets never grow up and go off to college and move out, right? They like, right. Yeah. you know, when you adopt a dog, like, you know, when we adopted Seymour, we were saying like, we will take care of you until you die, which is a really intense thing, you know what I mean? And you know, when you're a kid too, I think, and rightfully so, parents really emphasize like pets are a lot of work. It's a big responsibility. You keep asking for a guinea pig, but are you going to be the one who changes the wood chips every week and, you know, make sure that there's fresh food and water and all that stuff? Or like you have to get up and take a puppy out in the middle of the night to pee. Yeah. And so, I mean, that all makes sense. But I think therefore when a pet dies, you're really hit with this more so than like when a person dies, often you feel like sort of like, well, it was their time or they had their own agency, which obviously like there are situations with maybe if you've been caring someone who's for who's if you've been caring for someone who's very sick or in hospice or especially with like a child, um, you know, I've heard some really sad stories from parents losing children who feel that kind of responsibility and guilt. Um, mm -hmm. But with a pet, you know, I think it, you can't help but feel a little bit like it was my responsibility to keep this creature healthy and happy and alive. And even if it's like the dog is 18 years old and clearly like at the end of their life and that is what happens, it's inevitable. I think you still get hit with this guilt. And then I think when you are taking care of someone else's pet because your dog sitting or in my case in the book, hamster sitting, yes. you know, 
it's even heightened because you're like, well, it's one thing if I mess up care of my own pet and I'm just really bummed because my pet died. But, you know, to think that I'm taking this little creature that my friend loves so much and trying to make sure he's okay while she's at Disney World with her family. And like this hamster, as I write about in the book, was like my friend Mary put it, he was at his life expectancy when he she dropped him off. Like he was super old already. So she like wasn't even phased. But it's really stressful. And like, I think that's something I try to get at in the book too, is sort of like, there's this humorous element where it's like, we put ourselves in these high stress, worrisome situations yes. and um, often they end badly because, you know, animals just don't live as long as we want right. them. The circle of life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. So anyway, I, I just, people often tell me how guilty they feel. Like, oh, I should have noticed my cat was slowing down or I should have tried that other surgery. And it's like, everyone feels such guilt and it's, it's just often there's nothing you could do. It was, it's just the circle of life. Yeah, that also pointed out to me, and this made me feel a lot better that obviously animals have evolved to hide illness because in the wild that makes them, you know, vulnerable um, to predators. And so, you know, it's not your fault. Like cats especially are notorious for hiding illness until basically like it's fatal. Um, right. And my friend Karen Fine, who's a vet and wrote a really great book called The Other Family Doctor. She calls it a, um, he was fine last Tuesday cat where it's like the cat seem fine. And then you bring them in and they're like at death's door, but they just can hide it really well. Oh, they're so good. They're so good at animals just being their best for us. And yeah which makes it so hard. Well, since you brought up veterinarians and you did a lot, you did quite a few interviews with veterinarians. And one thing that I know you do mention is that nearly every veterinarian that you spoke with did mention a high suicide rate. The majority even mentioned that I found very interesting. I mean, I was shocked to learn that. I think I had always, I, I don't know. I remember learning in like high school or something like dentists or something of the highest suicide rate of any profession. And yeah. I was really shocked when I, when all these vets kept bringing it up when I interviewed them. And then there was this study that the CDC did actually that, you know, it's a health hazard basically for the occupation. And there are a few factors that contribute to it. One, it's a super high stress profession, right? Like with a oh. really high burnout rate and, you know, similar to doctors and nurses, you're providing care um, for a being uh, that people really love and care about. But unlike with human, you know, doctors, the pay is a lot lower, but going to vet school often is as expensive as going to medical yeah. school. So you still, you have incredible debt you're working long hours, especially since COVID, um, veterinary clinics are just like strapped with having like more pets than they can handle. Cause so many people got pets during COVID that they just like their waiting list to get your dog into a vet office. Oh. Um, and then also, and this is very normal, you know, when a person loses a pet and, um, they're upset, often they, you know, take their feelings out on someone else and vets, get caught in the crossfire all the time, you know, and they get accused of things like, you know, you said this surgery would get rid of my dog's cancer and it didn't. And the vet, you know, is trying to say, well, I said there was a chance it could help. I didn't promise that it was going to, you know, fix everything or, you know, no vet is promising they can make your pet live forever, but right. people... Yeah, you know, people are rightfully upset. And, and, you know, that is really draining and hard on veterinarians. And, and I think often there's just too much asked of them. Like one vet pointed out to me, she said, you know, human doctors are not expected to be both pediatricians and gerontologists. And like that, that line really stuck with me because, you know, like a vet starts seeing a puppy and they'll see that dog over the course of 10 years and the needs for that dog changes. And they also get attached to these pets and, and they get sad when, you know, their lives are at their end. So um, anyway, I felt like it was super important to write about this in the book because I just, you know, I understand when people get angry and take out there angry on medical professionals. Like people do that with, you know, human doctors all the time as well. Um, but, you know, I wanted to try to remind readers that, you know, 
our vets are our allies in taking care of our pets. You know, they also love our animals and they have, you know, pets of their own. They've gone through pet grief, you know, themselves. And it's really important to, um, you know, honor them and respect them and, you know, say thank you. Like, especially when they've helped, you know, ease your pet into the next plane, you know, it's vets. It means a lot to vets when you, you tell them, you know, you appreciated what they did. Exactly. And thank you for talking about that in the book, because I think it needed to be addressed and it's good for people to read that and think, oh yeah, you know what? They're human. They're doing the best they can. And they're in the profession because they care about our pets. I want to talk about the title, Good Grief. So where did that come from as the title? Or did you go through other ideas? What's funny is that I said, you know, the book took about 10 years to write. And I would say for the first six years, seven years in my head, um, yeah, it was about seven years until I sold the book. I just was calling it Dead Pets. Like that was the name of the book in my head. It was Dead Pets. And I had this it's image. What it of, is, right? We're like getting right to the point. <laughs> yeah, Dead Pets. And like I had this image that it would be a black cover with a white hamster skeleton on it. And it was just very dark and very funny and dark. And um when I finally did um sell the book to I, I initially sold it to Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and then they were bought out by harper collins during um the pandemic um so harper collins and eventually published it um my editor at hmh she said you know love the idea for the book i think a lot of people are going to read it resonate with it we cannot call it dead pets and i said why not I, and she was like it's too dark and i said but like my friends think it's funny and she was like you have a lot of very dark friends like i think <laughs> so we talked a lot about how like we wanted you know, this book to be something for a lot of different people. So like you could pick up this book and, you know, you maybe currently have living pets, but you've lost pets years ago. And this is something you can relate to, or maybe you just had a pet die last week, or you have an elderly pet and you're starting to think about, you know, what you're going to want to do when that pet goes. And we wanted this to be a book that, you know, you could buy and give to your friend, maybe who's lost a pet as well. And so for all those reasons, I understood that Dead Pets was maybe a little too like uh, crass or, you know, <laughs> tongue in cheek. So we yeah. did this big brainstorming session and ultimately um, uh, I came up with Good Grief, which I loved for three reasons. Um, one it is a nod to a very famous human canine friendship, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Yep, um, <laughs> and then I I also loved the, like kind of the exasperated tone a little bit like good grief. Because like I said, you know, it's like no one's forcing you to have pets and go through this sad, traumatic experience of pets dying. So it's sort of like good grief. Why do we keep doing this to ourselves? Right. And then the last reason is like, you know, the reason why I think we keep doing it over and over is because the grieving is worth it. It's a good type of grieving and having pets is so good and wonderful that that grief is worthwhile. Um, and there's a Zadie Smith essay where she writes about, you know, it only hurts as much as it's worth when you're grieving. And I think often, you know, a pet dying it hits so hard because it's so wonderful to have them in your life so to me good grief sort of captured that feeling as well it is definitely for everyone listening it is a joyful book because at first I wasn't sure I I'm a tear you know crier with a lot of things and it was heartfelt warm there was the joy yeah there was the sadness but it yeah it, it was I love it I love it so great job with that. And I have to ask, when doing the all these interviews and meeting all these people, learning about all these different rituals on what people do with their dead pets, did anything make you feel uncomfortable with the rituals? Because I got a little, a little bit uncomfortable in some that I read because I never really thought about some of them. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, my feeling when I finished the book, which it still is now, is there is no right or wrong way to grieve. Yeah. 
Exactly. As long as you are not hurting yourself or hurting other people, do mm -hmm. whatever you need to do, in my opinion. And don't let anyone tell you it's too weird. Um, Completely agree. And so I tried really hard, though, when I went into interviews to keep an open mind, especially yeah. for rituals I didn't know a lot about or things that I was maybe like, oh, I'm never going to want to do that. So like, honestly, like when I went into researching cloning, I was like, this is so expensive. Why would people do this? There's so many dogs in shelters. Can't you go and just adopt another dog versus paying all this money to have your dog replicated and, and it's not even actually your dog. Right. So I, I, I like felt this like judgment happening and I tried really hard to be like, okay, but you don't really know or understand why people want to do this. And that's what you're trying to find out, you know, so even if it's not for you. And I interviewed um, a woman who works at a cloning company. And then I also interviewed um, one of their company's clients, this gentleman named John. And I have to say, it was um, mind blowing to me because I came out of those interviews almost like, wait, maybe I do want to clone my dog one day because suddenly it, it made a lot of sense, you know, what they were saying. And even if, you know, it's not necessarily for me and something I want to pursue, you know, um, the uh, Cody, the woman who works at Viagen, which is the company I, I profile, you know, she pointed out people often, um, you know, have like an unusual mixed breed dog like Seymour, for example, and they want to replicate that. But maybe they got the dog neuter or spayed before they realized they wanted to breed the dog. So that's one way to do that. Um, and when I interviewed John and he talked about cloning his dog Princess, he said, you know, he loved the idea of her DNA living on. Like he fully knows that her, he has two clones of, of princess, you know, he knows they are not that same dog. Like they have a lot of similar quirks and mannerisms. And honestly, like he texts me photos and sometimes I have trouble telling like, which is the original dog and which ones are the clones. But he like, he knows they're different dogs and he just loves the idea that her DNA is still like alive in some form. And, you know, he made this point. He's like, a lot of my buddies spend 50 grand on fancy sports cars and stuff, you know, when they're retired. And he's like, I wanted to spend $50,000 on cloning my dog and drive a crappy old car. And it's like, you know, if that makes you feel better and that's what, you know, you have the money to do that. And like, you know, he acknowledged that not everyone can afford to do that, even if people want to, right. um, you know, I don't know. I say go for it. So, um, okay. yeah, but I, it was really interesting and, um, you know, it was, it was cool to hear all the different ways that people approach it. And I have to say, like, I went into both like the taxidermy interviews and the cloning interviews, sort of assuming that people who do that are like, I don't know, people who have trouble letting go of the fact that their pet is dead and they're trying okay. to re reanimate their pet either through okay. cloning or through, you know, preserving and taxidermy. And I honestly feel like those, the people I spoke to who have pursued those rituals often um, are more in touch with death um, in some ways. Like the woman I spoke to who had her uh, Boston Terrier preserved for, in taxidermy, like wow. she used to look at him every day and she's like, oh, I know that's not Ace anymore. Like his personality and, you know, is off in the world, but, you know, she sees it as a sculpture or like a 3D photograph and, and thinks he, you know, it's, it's cool to have him there in this different form. And um, I just thought it was really interesting. So yeah, there's no denying that your pet is dead if you have him taxidermied. So wow. I was really impressed by that, um, that outlook. So I can't imagine walking into someone's home that I know and knew their dog or cat and there it is stopped <laughs> just kind of, and I, it's something I never thought of doing myself you know what I mean going through those rituals of okay what am I going to do when my dog dies Texas and Jeremy does not cross my mind neither does cloning but I learned so much and again I I try to stay I have an open mind with everything and yeah, whatever works for your grief is the right thing for you. Totally. And, that. and I have to say, like with taxidermy, like, you know, I have these tortoises and they have these beautiful shells. And I was like, oh, I could see preserving just Terrence's shell, though, like Eat. he's probably going to outlive me. So, you know, jokes on me that I'll never get to do that. But, you know, it, it was really cool to see these different things that people have done and I think you know people get to be a lot more creative and do a lot more unusual things when their pets die because 
I mean, often, like, unfortunately, in some ways, like, pets are still considered property, right? Like, they belong to us legally. Like, you can't leave money to your dog. You can set up a trust that funds money for your dog's care, but, like, you can't actually give your dog money. Um, And so, similarly, though, like, when your pet dies, like, you own their body and kind, kind of taxidermy or clone or do things with it that you can't like with your grandmother you know um so I I think it's interesting to see the unusual things that people do and my goal for this book was I wanted it to read in some ways like an encyclopedia of options so you know you can you know you can say like okay my dog is dying. I'm trying to think about what I want to do. I just assumed I would cremate because that's what the vet right. suggested. But actually, there's so many things you can do if that's not right for you. So I wanted this to be like, read it, think about all the options and you know, figure out what fits for you and your family. So true. Because like I said, a lot of these things, many of these things are not things I had thought of to do. And I was like, oh, what a great book. And that leads me to the who is the book for but you kind of mentioned it in the beginning it could be anyone in that anticipatory grief phase somebody who you know is about to say goodbye that whole thing so that would be your reader probably yeah so definitely like anybody who has recently lost a pet or yeah. whose pet is at towards the end of their life um, but honestly, my friend from high school, Greg, he has, he is like next to my mom has probably bought the most copies of my book and he just keeps giving them to his friends whenever they get a new pet. Okay. And he, he's <laughs> Start like, hey. thinking about it today. <laughs> like, I know your puppy is six months old, but it's never too soon to be prepared and just have this in the back of your mind and like, enjoy the time you have with your pet. But like, and you know, he makes a good point because in some ways, like, it's so hard. Like, I remember when we euthanized my dog, Gus, and it's me and my parents and we're standing there and we're crying at the vet's office. And our vet was like, okay, so like, well, what do you want to do now? Do you want to cremate him? Like, do you want to take his body home? And we had never talked about it before that moment. We were just kind of standing there and we were like, uh, I guess cremate. I don't know. And then like, you know, his body's kind of rushed off and that's that. And we were like, oh, like maybe we should have had a conversation or at least like thought about it before it actually happened. And it's really hard then too, when you're actively like grieving to then have to make choices about like, okay, I want to bury my dog in a pet cemetery. What's the closest pet cemetery? How do I get a plot? Are they even accepting burials? You know, and it's much better in my opinion, like if your dog is like five or six and you know, eventually like that's what you want to do, like go get a plot in a pet cemetery and have it ready. Like, I mean, people do that, right? Like my grandparents bought cemetery plots like 20 years ago and they've just been sitting on them, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, I think maybe Greg, it's like, especially morbid to be like, here's a new puppy. Here's a book about pets. (laughs) It's like, hopefully nobody gets offended and they know him well. They're like, okay, yeah, this would be a great gift. (laughs) But like, I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense to definitely start to think about these things and have these conversations, you know, while your pet is alive and healthy and you're not grieving. And I think what's hard to with pets is often like with a family pet, the animal, you know, belongs to a lot of people and often people when they're grieving need different things. So, you know, like I interviewed couples where like the wife wanted to be in the room with the dog when the euthanasia was happening. And the husband was like, I I can't do it. I have to be outside. Like I can't. And then, you know, then the husband wants to sit with the dog after the dog has passed. But then the wife is like, I need the body out of the house. I like I'm done, you know, and it's, and, you know, it's it's hard because, like, maybe you have one person in the family who wants a taxidermy and two people who want to cremate. And it's like you're trying to figure out what's something that can work for everybody. Right. Um, and that's that's hard. So I think, you know, the sooner you can have conversations like that, the better, in my opinion. Well, thank you so much, Evie, for chatting to you. Do you have anything else that you want to share? Any last minute words of wisdom or something that you learned that you feel is most important and impactful? I mean, I think the things that are most important, I I already mentioned, which is, you know, when you're grieving a pet, you may feel very isolated and alone. And like, you're this weirdo who's so upset about losing an animal, but you are not. There are so many people who have gone through it, are going through it. Um, 
like my friend Katie's dog just died this weekend and we were texting, you know, like there's always somebody, um, you know, who you can talk to. And yeah. then, you know, like I said, there's no right or wrong way to grieve and also no length of time too. you know, grieving is not a linear thing. And that applies to all types of grief, not just pets. Right. So like, um, you know, I, I talked to people who said, you know, my cat died in the summer and the summer was really sad and hard. I started to feel better in the fall. And then all of a sudden we put up our Christmas tree and I lost it because the cat would always climb up and hide in like the Christmas tree branches. And then it's like, all of a sudden it hits you again, that it's like, Oh, oh he's not here to do that this year. Because, mm -hmm. And that's like, it's, and that's so normal, right. That happens with people too, right. You're like, this is the first Christmas without my mom. This is the first, you know, mother's day without my mom, like all these different things. And so, you know, just being kind to yourself, giving yourself space, um, and the other thing too, is I'm actually really a big proponent of posting on social media when you've lost a pet, because, mm -hmm. um, I joke that like pet internet is like the last nice place on the internet. Um, people are generally pretty supportive. I mean, there, there are sometimes is like fights and, in, in pet groups I've been part of about like different theories on training and. Oh food, yeah. That's whatever. yeah. But, but when it comes to grief, it's grief, people, people get, get it. And mm -hmm. I think it's so nice because you can post, you know, a tribute on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And people like you and I who get it can comment and we can engage. Yes. And, you know, people who don't have pets or just think you're overreacting, they can kind of just scroll by yeah. and kind of let yeah. it go. And, and like my friend, Annie Hartnett, who she's a, a great novelist, you should read her books, a lot of pets in them. And her dog Harvey, when he was dying, she was posting like every day on Facebook updates about his health. And, and like when he eventually died, she said she got like 40 sympathy cards from people because people have been following on Facebook and knew she was going through this really hard time. So, um, you know, I think putting it out there allows people to help you when you're upset. And I think it's so hard too with pets because often actually my friend Katie was just saying this. She was like, you know, when you're grieving a pet, it's so hard because usually you turn to your pet for comfort when you're upset. Oh. And then when your pet's gone, it's like, well, who do I go to? So um, I think just remembering you're not alone. There are a lot of people out there. Um, and I guess the last thing too, is I hope that if people are hesitant to read my book, they'll know that I tried to put a lot of humor and levity and joy into it. And I, I hope it comes across really as a love letter to having pets and not just the hard, sad part that comes at the end. Cause obviously it's worth it. Otherwise we wouldn't all keep having pets over and over and over again. Over and over and going through that grief over and over again. Oh, awesome. I love that. Thank you so much, Evie. And again, her book is Good Grief on Loving Pets Here and Hereafter. Definitely an amazing yeah, read and it did bring some peace to me and a lot of joy in it. I love your stories. I love it. it's very well written and thank you for doing the book. And thank you so much. And also I forgot to say, I have an Instagram account for the book. It's Good Grief Pets Book on Instagram and people submit um, photos and memorials and obituaries for their pets. And it's a really nice way for people to share their losses. So if you want to be part of that uh, little Good Grief Instagram community, you're welcome to check it out. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, EB. This was awesome. This was so much fun. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. I got my grandmother stuffed after she died in 2005. She's sitting over there in the corner. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys, a kid, a kid. My gram is one of the big reasons I am who I am today. And she would have laughed her Gaelic tune off at that idea. There's another side to good grief that E.B. may not have realized when she was hashing out the name of her book. And that's that we can have a good experience during grief. Grief is mostly associated with loss and pain. The idea of good grief implies that there might be positive aspects or experiences associated with this intense and often distressing emotion. But grief, despite its inherent pain and overwhelming difficulty, can be a catalyst for growth, resilience, and a deeper understanding of life and ourselves. While we experience the sadness, the anger, the denial, the bargaining, and the eventual acceptance, grief is a deeply personal experience. And its impact can be profound, affecting not only our emotional state, but also our physical and social well-being. 
It can be transformative, forcing us to confront our emotions, face the reality of loss, and reevaluate how we live and how we prioritize our day-to-day -day life. We might reassess our values, our relationships, our life goals, and we might find new meaning and purpose as we learn more about ourselves, our friends and family, and the world around us. If we let it, grief can be an incredible teacher. And for that reason alone, it's why I'm sitting here talking you, to you today. Grief is the price we pay for love, as E.B. pointed out in her interview with Darlene. The depth of our grief is often a testament to the depth of our love for and connection to our pets. Our grief gives us the opportunity to honor our pets' lives and cherish the memories we created together. Something I hope eventually brings you joy if you belong to this club of loved and lost. Feel no shame or embarrassment in creating shrines and legacies to your beloved companion animal. Tell people how much you loved your dog, your cat, your horse. If they don't want to listen, find someone else to talk to. You know I'll always listen. And I'm just at the other end of an email to Angela at OneLastNetwork.com or our Instagram account at OneLastNetwork. Next week, we learn about the boundaries we may want to set when we're in grief over the loss of our best fur friends. Relationship expert Cheryl Green joins me to chat about how to keep ourselves safe from even the people who may love us. Until then. I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.